Welcome to this video on the top 10 werewolves of the Get of Fenris. The Get are the designated Scandinavian and Germanic werewolves of the Garu Nation, and to their way of thinking, the mightiest warriors in the Garu Nation, as superior to their fellow werewolves as werewolves are to man or wolves. This is not simply because they are the descendants of the greatest warrior of the first pack, the father wolf, Fenris, or because they are the descendants of the Vanir, one of the two tribes of gods in Norse mythology. It is because they continually seek to test themselves, and others, just as Fenris tested himself until he became the perfect warrior, and tested the goddess Sigyn before making her his mate. The Get would rather face Ragnarok, the Apocalypse, and the entire host of Jormungandr, with a company of only 100 of the strongest possible warriors, than with an army of 10,000 weaklings. But without further ado, the top 10 werewolves of the Get of Fenris. Number 10, the Skythroat. The Fianna and the Get of Fenris have both allied and warred with each other for millennia. One of their most notable battles was not of claves and claws, but in song. A Fenrir Galliard known only in lore as the Skythroat not only bested the Fianna, but called down Luna to Earth to hear her sing. The Skythroat was a skald, or poet, in the time when the Germanic tribes first reached into the rest of the European continent with an early Gothic migration from Scandinavia. Her voice could echo like a gentle trickling brook, or crash like the thunder of cascading water. Her song could compel bad kings to give up their evil ways and turn harsh winters into pleasant springs. As to the matter by which the Skythroat won her title, the Fenrir and the Fianna challenged one another for possession of a cairn, as has so often happened in history. Challenges were made and accepted on both sides, but each accused the other of cheating in the end result. The Fianna challenged the Fenrir to a contest of the voice, rather than a battle to the death which would have emptied the area of Gauru warriors and severely weakened whoever emerged victorious. Now the Get believed that the Fianna were simply afraid to meet the Fenrir superior warriors in open battle but the Fianna even dared to taunt the Fenrir into accepting a challenge they could not possibly win. But little did the Fianna know that it would be the Skythroat who would accept their challenge, with the blessing of the Fenrir elders. Fianna and Fenrir Galliards matched each other, not to see who could sing the sweeter, but who could achieve the greater wonder through the power of their voice alone. The Fianna Galliards' enchanted song rolled along the valleys and seeped into the earth. Everywhere his voice touched, lush forests grew up until the contested cairn was surrounded and protected for leagues around. The Fenrir Aruns grumbled to each other that accepting the challenge had been folly, and that they should blood the Fianna right then and there. But the Skythroat stepped forward, and all Garu heard the most beautiful song that any of them would ever hear in their lives. All who listened swore that the voice of the Skythroat was the same that Gaia herself used to coax the world into being. A great mountain grew up around the cairn and the forest, raising them high above all. Then the Skythroat called to the moon, and Luna, in all of her silvery glory, descended from the heavens and bathed the Garu in her blessed light. To the mortals who witnessed this amazing sight, it appeared that the moon fell to the earth, landed somewhere in the mountains, and then rose back up into the sky. The Fianna conceded victory to the Skythroat with all respect, but because of Luna's influence, the Fenrir offered to share the cairn with the Fianna. Today, the Sept of Luna's Forest Glory remains a shared Sept, and the strongest bond between the Fianna and the Get of Fenris. Number 9. Stefan Blood Moon Child. In 235 AD, a dire omen appeared in the sky over Germania. A blood-red crescent moon rose in the night. It was under this moon that the wife of a local chieftain gave birth to a Fenrir cub. The Fenrir elders witnessed this omen and wondered what it might mean. All agreed that it was a sign of great peril, but could not agree as to what this peril might be and what role the cub would play in it. A debate broke out between the elders of the Get, some who called for the destruction of the cub who was doubtless a poisonous tool of the worm, and others who said that the cub should be raised among them, as the boy was likely a valuable asset in whatever the future danger might be. 
The Ghetto Fenris abducted Stefan from his home and brought him to the Sept of the Harrowing Sky in western France. When Stefan underwent the first change, his fur was as red as the blood moon under which he had come into the world. This was another ill omen, some argued, and again called for the cub's destruction. But again, the Fenrir elders would not hear it, and instead sent Stefan into isolation on a mountain until such time as they could decide his fate. After ten years of such isolation, the elders summoned Stefan to be tested. He met each of their challenges with wisdom and grace, and emerged from his rite of passage as Stefan Bloodmoonchild. But one Fenrir in particular was not pleased with the success and quiet approval Stefan received, an Audrin Ragabash named Wards the Dead, who feared that Stefan was a servant of Jormungandr, the Worm. Wards the Dead would come up with particularly cruel and inventive supposed tests for Stefan, hoping to expose what Wards the Dead believed was Stefan's true nature. But Stefan continually proved himself to be an asset to the Sept and an honorable shaman, his renown spread throughout the tribe, and many Fenrir considered him to be the wisest Garu their tribe had ever produced. Stefan went on many sacred quests and opened realms and zones that the Get of Fenris would continue to use, even in the final days. But Wards the Dead could not contain the irrational hatred he felt for Stefan, a hatred that in time grew to include his fellow Fenrir. This opened his spirit to the urgings of the worm, and Wards the Dead became the very thing he believed that Stefan was, a tool of corruption. When the seasonal great hunt came, Wards the Dead conspired to lure Stefan into a trap, which ended in the slaying of both Stefan and the quarry of the hunt. The Sept was overcome with grief at Stefan's death. Spirits that had befriended Stefan revealed that Wards the Dead had a hand in the Theurge's death, and the Sept slew him for his treachery. The Sept then sent word that both Stefan and Wards the Dead perished in battle against the forces of the Worm, to protect the reputation and honor of both. But Wards the Dead's spirit was claimed by the Worm, and he became a servant of Abhora, the Malesian incarna of hatred, and an emissary between the Worm and a hive of black spiral dancers that desired to destroy the Sept of the Harrowing Sky. But Wards the Dead did not want to destroy only one Sept, his ambition, in death, was to annihilate the entire Get of Fenris. Years later, a Korax were-raven appeared at the Sept with tales of a wolf spirit living in the mountains where Stefan had once dwelt in solitude. The pack sent to investigate was surprised to discover that it was Stefan Bloodmoonchild himself, returned to the world by Gaia as an ancestor spirit. He gave the Sept many useful gifts and returned in his own person to guard them against the hive of Wards the Dead. When the Black Spiral Dancers attacked, Stefan Bloodmoonchild fought his foe and both disappeared into the Umbra. Most of the Sept was slain, but the Black Spiral Dancers hive was wiped out. To this day, the Sept of the Harrowing Sky holds an annual festival in honor of Stefan Bloodmoonchild and attempts to contact his spirit without success. Number 8. Gunnar Dragerbane. In days of old, there lived a skilled seafarer named Skold Nifungsen of Halogaland, who, with his warriors, plundered the Franks. His fame was such that he was able to claim Efura the Fair, kin to Floki Vilgerason, who first sailed to Iceland. Skold was kinfolk to the Ged of Fenris. In Halgolaland, Efura bore Skold two sons, Gunnar, the greatest hero of the Get of Fenrist, and his brother, Einar. When the brothers had their first change, Skull's brother brought them to the Get, where they learned of the history of the Fenrir. They were tested without pity by the grim elders of the Get, but finally, they were sworn by oath and by blood to the Get of Fenris. Gunnar, with his ferocity and strength, attracted a band of young, wild warriors to him, who made him their Jarl, and together they sailed from Norway seeking blood, plunder, and glory. In Denmark, the Get Vikings met Donar Danedog, a bone gnar who became fast friends with Gunnar and joined them in their voyage. They set out for Scotland, where they raided towns and slew a pack of black spiral dancers before returning to the sea. Then they attacked the Saxons and Wales. There they encountered three Fianna, 
who they challenged to a battle. Gunnar slew Tufiana himself, while the other fell to Osmund the Young, who bore the great axe Odin. The Fenrir were sad to see such worthy foes perish, and honored them as warriors worthy of Valhalla. Then the Get sailed to Brittany, where more longboats joined them. As his father's skull once did, Gunnar attacked the Franks with sword, axe, fire, and claw. Gold and riches flowed into their hands like water. When fall came, the fleets broke up to return to their homes. Gunnar returned north and dwelled with the Fenris kin in Lotus. While drinking mead at the home of Hagbard Sigurdsson, Hurt Gillison came stumbling in from the high oplands, bearing the dark tale of Starketh. Starketh was once an honest man who traded wood with the bear worshippers, the Finns, and the Lops. Three winters before, he sent his son to the Fens in his place. When his son did not return, Starkath went to find him. He found the young man, naked in the snow, white as a bleached bone, and feasting on the corpses of the dead. Starkath's son had been taken by the Draugr and made into a bloodthirsty fiend. But Starkath was armed with a sword made by the dwarves from Brimir's blood and slew his only son. He then swore vengeance on the land and the Draugr of the forest. The Laps begged him not to go into the forest. It was haunted by ghosts who hated the day. But Starketh, his heart filled with grief and fury, marched alone into the haunted forest. A year later, Starketh was once again seen in Opland and returned to his farm. But he dwelled there alone as his remaining family fled from the place. Whatever happened in the Finnish forest, Starketh was now a Draugr himself, just as his son had been. The farmers of Opland found two fighters who said they would slay Starketh. Instead, Starketh butchered them and nailed their corpses to the great trees around his farm. The people of High Opland were fleeing their homes, rather than wait for a visit in the cold winter from Draugr Starketh, who had once been their neighbor. Gunnar listened to Hrut Gillison's tale with grim silence. Then the Get Jarl declared that he would slay this enemy of life and claim the honor of such a victory. When he asked who would come with him, all of his men swore to follow. But Gunnar told his brother and helmsman, Einar, to stay in Lotus, as he still suffered from a deep wound courtesy of the Fianna and the Franks. But Einar answered him, Bear is his back who has no brother. Gunnar honored his younger brother, then they took up arms for the great battle in Opland. Hrut Gillison led the warriors to Opland, and the people told them where to find Starkath's place, but warned them that the Draugr was not alone. He had made himself as a thane of the dead, and embraced several warriors to serve him. The Ged encountered two of these warriors at a farm near Starkath's place, Cormac One-Eye and Bersi the Brave. Gunnar roared and the werewolves attacked, but Bersi's swift sword sliced through Vali Vikerson, one of Gunnar's pack and master of rune lore. Vali fell dead in the snow, his warm blood staining the white red. Einar Skolson and Osmund the Young sent Bersi to final death as Thorstein the giant held the quick, lethal Bersi close to him. Gunnar engaged Cormac in battle. Gunnar, whose might was so prodigious that he tore Cormac's arm free of his body with one claw and hurled his body into the rocks with another. Filled with rage, Gunnar smashed Cormac's skull with a massive granite slab. It was then that Starkath himself entered the fray. Emerging from the blackness of the night, the Draugir leapt on Gunnar Skolson's back and bit down on his neck. Einar, seeing his brother in the Draugir's grasp, took up his knife and tried to gut the fiend, but Starketh's wounds disappeared as quickly as they had been made. Starketh then released Gunnar and turned on Einar. He spoke with grim finality to Einar Skolson. Your life I will have as Weregild for my warriors. Starketh's dwarven sword sliced into Einar's body three times before the Garu warrior fell at the vampire's feet. Gunnar grasped Starkath's sword before he could deliver the killing blow to Einar. Never have I felt such strength, the Draugr said. 
Gunnar Skolson replied, I am stronger than any man or wolf. I am the wild moon killer, and I will make pitch for my boats from your crushed bones. Starkath recognized him. You are Gunnar of the Get, the greatest warrior. You walk with your weird, but I am strongest in winter and more clever than any crazed werewolf. The Dagir released his sword and disappeared into the night again, leaving neither footprint nor scent to track him. Gunnar looked to his brother, Einar, broken, dying in the cold winter. Einar forced his last words out through ragged breaths. Without a brother, a man is without bonds. My death and your skill will slay undead Starketh. Then Einar Skolson's spirit departed for Valhalla. Gunnar Skolson wept tears of bitter rage, tore at the earth and howled at the still, pitiless night for his lost brother. The Jarl called on the spirits of wolves and earth to aid him. Dunar Danedog felled Starkath's last Draugr's servant, who tried to betray his master's secret hiding place, a burial mound north of the farm in the forest. The Draugr begged for his unlife, but Gunnar laughed and beheaded the fiend with Starkath's own sword. Gunnar then gathered his men and told them that Tyr would tear down this man of hell. He would drive this creature from Midgard, who dared to defy death. Then a raven came among them, a good omen for ravens were the eyes of Odin and the ears of the wolves. The raven revealed himself as Ranvig, the wise, a Korax, the were-raven told the get, Thrice will I grant brave Gunnar advice. Follow my flight, and I will lead you to your foe's forsaken lair. Gunnar belted Starkath's sword. Broder's Bane is your name now, Gunnar told the sword, and no one save I shall lift you. Then Gunnar cradled Einar's body in his arms and carried him into the forsaken woods, followed by his warriors. When the Get warriors reached the mist-covered veil that held the burial mound, Gunnar stopped them. I will enter alone, he said. Await me at camp. If I do not return, either kill me or leave. Vengeance is mine alone. My vow dooms me forward. I have sworn it to the gods. May the skalds sing of it. Ranviak called, your enemy will return ere the sun rises. Gunnar then forced the entrance of the burial mound open. He placed Einar's body before the entrance of the door and dressed it in his own gear. Gunnar gathered wood and sharpened the ends to spear points, then set them deep in the burial mound. Gunnar then hid behind some rocks near Einar's body. As dawn approached, Starketh returned to the mound. Ah, I have caught Gunnar sleeping, Starketh said, and fell on the dead Einar. Gunnar then attacked Starketh from behind crushing the Draugr's ribs as he gripped him and threw him into the burial mound. Gunnar followed, but was quickly waylaid by Starketh. You tricked me outside, the Draugr hissed, but in the dark I will drain you, and you will wither in winter's darkest night. But then, another entered the fray. Dane Dog attacked Starketh and broke the vampire's grip on Gunnar. Gunnar seized Starketh and hurled him into one of the spears fixed inside of the mound. Starketh screamed in pain and anger. Gunnar hefted another spear and threw it right into Starketh's unbeating heart. Starketh cursed as he died. You will be killed, Gunnar the Great, abandoned by Wolfkin, gone to far country. Gunnar dragged Starketh's impaled body into the dim sunlight and let Helios purify the Draugr once and for all. The Get then turned on Dane Dog and demanded to know why he had come. The Bone Nar answered that he had pledged loyalty to Gunnar, who had lost a brother. Dane Dog then offered to share blood and be bound kin to Gunnar forever, a brother in place of the one he had lost. Gunnar smiled sadly. Alone. No one should be bereft of kin, he said. Dane Dog, now I am Gunnar Dragerbane. The two swore brotherhood and went to find a place fit to bury their fallen brother, Einar. Number 7. Tardia Hardrule Before the beginning of the Viking era, 
a Get Philodox named Tardia was born in the valleys of eastern Norway. When his family was slain by a band of Scandinavian raiders, Tardia, at the unheard of age of five, underwent the first change and tracked down the murderers across the better part of the European continent. For three years, the child Garu hunted his prey without knowledge or help from any of his kind. When he returned to Norway, covered in blood and glory, he was met by the Fenrir, who accepted him into their ranks as though he had already passed the rites of passage. For the next ten years, Tardia sharpened his already prodigious fighting ability to a razor's edge. Older Garu treated him as a peer. Soon after, he became leader of his own pack and joined in taking cairns in Britain for the tribe. He then became the youngest recognized Jarl for several centuries before or after, when he claimed the sept of the valiant Hammer of Vengeance on the Faroe Islands between Norway and Iceland. Jarl Tarja Hardrul was a harsh leader, even by the standards of the Ged of Fenris. His punishments were severe for all crimes or failures. None dared stand against him for fear of losing a challenge to him. But in time, his extreme discipline sapped the strength of his sept, and his warriors were continuously wounded or battered, if not from fighting the sept's enemies, then from being pummeled by the Sept's leader. Then, in 803 AD, the Sept of the Valiant Hammer of Vengeance was attacked and destroyed by another Sept of Fenrir warriors. While Jarl Tardia killed more foes than any other, he was finally brought low as his remaining warriors betrayed him to the enemy. Those who had turned on Jarl Tardia were accepted into the new Sept, but they lost all renown and rank they had once enjoyed. Meanwhile, Tardia passed into death in glory and song. It was said that he continued to fight, even after losing every limb in battle, snapping and biting his enemy's legs with his powerful jaws. Tardia's severed Krinos head was mounted on a pike until the birds had cleaned it of flesh. Then Fenrir Theurgis turned it into a powerful fetish, the head of hard rule, a helm that grants the wearer unequaled battle discipline and resistance to pain. The head remains a sacred object to the Fenrir in the final days, and stands as proof that whatever faults a warrior might possess, his strength can make him immortal throughout the ages. Number 6. Brunhild Blood Avenger Brunhild lived in the early 9th century Scandinavia and became a Garu later in life, after marriage and childbirth. She was wed to John Halthorson and bore him three sons and two daughters. When Brunhild's mother became sick, she left her husband's village to return to her mother's home and care for her. Her father had been killed in battle and no one else was left to care for the old woman. But while Brunhild was away, a band of trolls attacked her home, killed her husband and sons, and carried off her daughters. After her mother died, Brunhild returned to her village to find the rotting corpses of her husband and children. That was when she experienced the first change. She had not been found or inducted in the ways of the Garu beyond what certain knowledgeable kinfolk knew. But for days and nights, she stalked the trolls in the shape of a wolf, feeding from whatever forage and prey the land afforded her. Brunhild came upon her daughter's remains. They had been sorely abused and discarded by the trolls. But when she saw their bloodied hands, Brunhild knew that they had fought to their last. Her grief at their deaths was lessened by pride in their valor. And then for three fortnights, she chased the trolls. During her travels, she fought a servant of Jormungandir, who tried to seduce her to the side of the worm, and three giants who would have made her their shared wife. All met death at her claws. When she finally neared the trolls, great Fenris came to her in a dream. The massive father wolf asked her what she desired more than life itself. Brunhild did not cower in the presence of the Lord of Wolves, nor did she hesitate in answering with one word, revenge. This pleased the great wolf, and he taught her gifts to use against the murder of her family, and gave her enough rage to fuel a hundred warriors. When day broke, she set eyes on the trolls, forty in all. Brunhild fell upon them with the fury of Fenris himself. Though the trolls were armed with poison and silver weapons, they all fell to her claws, though she suffered greatly in doing so. When the battle was over, 
Brunhild claimed the heads of the trolls and returned to her husband's village. She called out to the families of the village to bear witness that she had claimed vengeance for her dead. Fenrir came from other villages to honor her deed. Then the elders of the tribe arrived and named her Brunhild Blood Avenger. Immediately after being so named, Brunhild fell dead from her battle wounds. Her song has since been sung at the formal moots of the Get, as a reminder of the importance of vengeance. Number 5. Tor de Brunvant Scab Slasher Tor Brunvant was a native of Atlanta, Georgia, and relatively new to the Get, having only received his name Scab Slasher two years before. But in those two years, Scab Slasher has done his best to make life miserable for the allies of the worm in the American Southwest. Tor and his multi-tribal pack, the Hammer of Justice, have delayed or shut down construction projects in the Atlanta area and slain numerous human drug dealers, rapists, murderers, and pimps. Scab Slasher has actually been very careful to disguise these killings in ways that protect the veil. He does not fall on his enemies with claws and fangs. If his victims ever make it into the news, it is usually reported that they died in some horrific accident or a domestic violence incident. Some commend him for his unusual subtlety, at least for a get. Some of Tor's most notable activities involve derailing trains carrying supplies for Pentex, thanks to information given to him by kinfolk who work as file clerks with the railways. Trucking material is no safer, as rigs targeted by Scab Slasher have the unusual habit of crashing and catching fire. As proof of his power, Tor Brunvant can summon tornadoes to hit some of his targets. Twisters have occasionally touched down right on top of trailers which also served as drug dens and then disappeared as quickly as they happened. Localized twisters indeed. Number 4. Karin Jarsdotter. The firstborn and only Garu child of Magni Mountainbreaker, Jarl of the Sept of Anvilklaven in Northern Europe, Karin was her father's favorite child and chosen successor when it became apparent that she had bred true. This displeased some of the Get who desired the title of Jarl for themselves or balked at the idea of being led by a woman. Magni defeated all who challenged him but was still concerned that someone might attempt to harm his wife and daughter, so he sent them to the United States. Karin was raised among the American Get, who respected her father's strength and reputation, but cut her no slack in her training. In the crucible of trials and battles, Karin became a strong warrior and a capable leader. When the time for her rite of passage came, she was given the Garu name Jarl's daughter. Not long after her 25th birthday, word crossed the Atlantic that Magni Mountainbreaker had died. His final wish was that Karin return home to the Sept of Anvilklaven and take her place as Jarl. Dutiful to the last, Karin returned home and issued the challenge, defeating all other claimants and taking the title as hers. Among the Get, only the strong rule, and Karin Jarl's daughter has shown no sign of weakness. There is some controversy around her. She has the blood of the European Get, but was raised by the Americans. She has been able to bridge some of the hostile waters between the two, but some Get argue that she does not belong to either one. Her youth is also held as a mark against her. Additionally, some of the more traditional Get are still not sold on this wild idea that women can be competent leaders. For her part, Karin Jarl's daughter knows that her position is a treacherous one, and seeks to rule her sept by being the absolute best Fenrir possible. As a philodox, she also endeavors to be a just and wise leader. Number 3. Thunder's Teeth In the wilderness of Scandinavia and Finland, there is rumored to exist a snow-white wolf god, a son of Fenris himself, who hunts only the mightiest of prey. This massive wolf is said to be nearly the size of a bear and can devour a man whole. But Thunder's Teeth, a lupus get of Fenris, is no rumor. He is both very old and very real. Thunder's Teeth is the informal leader of the Finnish get of Fenris. Informal because he has never actually been chosen by Moot, 
nor challenged anyone to claim the title of Jarl. Politics disinterest him. But when Thunder's teeth growls or speaks, other Garu pay attention. He is respected, feared, and most importantly, obeyed. Like any wise man, or wise Garu in this case, infighting angers him. He regards it as an absurdity and a vanity. The challenge for strength is important to the Get, but destroying each other for mere pride is foolishness. Thunder's teeth is capable of making his displeasure felt against those who challenge him. He leaves his opponents battered, clawed, throated, and hopefully wiser for the experience. Number 2. Krieger Silvermane tears at the heart of the worm. Krieger Silvermane is the oldest lupus get and the most venerable of the get of Fenris in the final days. For 80 years, the Fenrir Theurge has traveled the United States of America, battling the servants of Jormungandir and slaying hundreds of the worm's servants. He has sired numerous litters of pups, with each always producing at least one true Garu. In the 1930s, Krieger's pack, the Banebreakers, battled a worm spirit called Windspear, which was the cause of the Dust Bowl that tore through the American heartlands. Many Garu died before the Banebreakers arrived. Krieger used powerful rituals to force the beast into a slumber, then banished it back into the Umbra. During the great Fenrir moot of 1942, it was Krieger who openly challenged the German Fenrir that had sided with the Third Reich. Though he was heavily opposed at first, his wisdom won over many undecided or hostile get to the folly of allowing the Reich to continue to exist. As for those who would not be swayed by words, he met them with fangs and claws. Every get who challenged him was defeated, though in defiance of Fenrir custom, he spared their lives. In the final days, Krieger Silvermane dwells in the umbral homeland of the Get, preparing for the great conchalation, when all tribes shall gather to prepare for the apocalypse. Embodied in Krieger Silvermane are all that the Get of Fenris stand for, wisdom, fairness, honor, and martial prowess. He knows when to meet his enemies with overwhelming force, and when to tolerate those who may not be as strong as the Get, but serve Gaia's purpose in their own lesser way. Number 1. Golgol Fangs First He is quite possibly the most famous Get of Fenris in the final days, if not the most powerful. Golgol Fangs First, born for war, born in war, and has known no other life. In truth, he desires nothing else. Gogol's mother was a Fenrir warrior who carried him even as she fought the Get's enemies across Europe during World War II. Gogol was born in the middle of a battle, his mother stopping only long enough to give birth to him before returning to the fight. She joined the honored dead in Valhalla that same day. But her pack gained great honor that day, and when the war was done, Gogol was raised by them. They considered the boy a good omen, the first of a new generation destined for greatness. The wolf blood was true in him, and Gogol in time grew into a powerful Fenrir Aru. He lusted for war and the taste of his enemy's blood. For the entirety of his life, war called to him as if it were his own mother, and he answered. He fought as a mercenary on battlefields around the world, in Southeast Asia, in the Balkans, and in Central Asia. Gogol's bloodlust was tempered by a coldly tactical mind. He mastered war, but never allowed it to master him. In the mid-1980s, Pentex began operating in the Amazon Basin. When the Black Frost Pack was massacred by a Pentex First team, Gogol Fangs First, by this time an elder and one of the deadliest Garu alive, assumed command of the Get of Fenris forces preparing to answer the Amazon kinfolk's call for aid. Killian Stormfist of the Fianna challenged Gogol's claim of leadership over the entire Amazon war operation. Gogol dealt with the Fianna in short order and forced him to concede. The Shadow Lords and the Black Furies made their own feeble bids to wrest control from Gogol and each failed in their turn. When Pentex completed their Amazon headquarters thanks to the Garu's bickering, 
the other 12 tribes conceded leadership to Gogol on the condition that he recognize a war council of their elders to advise him on the most important decisions. Gogol agreed to this. To impose discipline on the tribes and the forces in the Amazon, Gogol implemented the warg system in the Amazon, effectively a chain of command for the Garu, placing a handful of packs under the command of a warg, or battle master. A group of three wargs in turn answered to a war leader. Two war leaders answered to either the war chieftain of the North or South Cairns, and at the top of the system is the high war chieftain, Gogol. Whatever the war in the Amazon throws at him, and whatever hell is unleashed during Ragnarok, the apocalypse, Gogol will meet it as he has met every other enemy during his long life. Fangs first. And those were the top ten werewolves of the Geta Fenris. The Fenrir embody a very old and very brutal kind of martial valor. They regard strength as not only their birthright, but their duty to Gaia. Other tribes complain about the Get bullying them when taking their cairns. The thing is, the Get make no secret of how to stop this. Punch them in the snout hard enough and long enough, and the Get will go, Okay, I guess you're good enough to keep your territory and then leave you alone, at least most of the time. While iron sharpens iron is a mentality of the Get and commendable in some ways, there is a point at which the only thing you're left with is an especially sharp iron toothpick if you're not careful. But the next tribe is one that isn't much for the so-called ancient ways or the good old days. In fact, they are willing to change, adapt, and adopt whatever tools, technologies, and organizations present themselves in fighting the worm from within the heart of the weaver. They've gone by several names in Garu history, but in the final days, they call themselves the Glasswalkers. Until next time.